The Home Assistant 2025.11 beta release has just been pushed out. Here's an overview of this month's changes. As usual, it's a beta release, so not everything is guaranteed to make it into the final release, but usually they're pretty good about it. Normally, when you are creating an automation, you are given three different options to choose from. The trigger, the condition, and the action. And clicking one of these would present a dialog box that has the different options available for that section. In this new release, that dialog box has been completely overhauled. So instead of hiding most things behind these expandable menus, it shows all of the major categories on the left-hand side of this new dialog box. This makes it way easier to see the types of actions that you could do in your automation. And so you can click on each one of these and it will show you the different sub options that are available. And of course, there's always a search box like before. So if you needed to find something, but you weren't sure what category it was under, you can look for it that way too. Now the same options are available for triggers, conditions, and actions. Nothing new has been added here, but it's a huge user interface overhaul for how we interact and find those different options in our automations. And for the conditions and actions, boxes, the what are called building blocks. Those are more of the logical actions that you can do to fine tune your automations. Those have been moved into a separate section. So that's where the choose statements, the loop statements or the if statements, those are all located under the blocks section. And this new dialog box update has also been added to scripts as well. So if you have a lot of scripts, you'll see the same updates over there too. So let's say you're making an automation that turns on the lights. You would go to actions, and then you would choose light and then you would go down to light turn on and then you could add your light that way you could also just search for light and it would also pop up in the results then once you've put that action into your automation you can then choose the light that you want to act on through the target picker over on the right hand side speaking of targets the target picker has also been completely overhauled in prior versions the target picker was that part of the actions section that you would have to choose your device or entity type and then scroll through all the different options in order to find the right one. That was kind of a tricky part because there'd be a lot of similarities between devices that were in different areas or different entities. Like for example, how many things do you have called battery? Probably a lot. If you were to do an audit of your home assistant instance right now, you'd probably find a lot of things called battery or presence or light or something of that nature. And so because that context was missing, they decided to completely overhaul it. They're still broken out into four sections like before, entities, devices, areas, and labels. But now there's this really nice looking box that lets you choose the specific device or the specific room that you want to act on. And then you can see what actual devices underneath the hood are being acted against. For example, in that automation that we were creating earlier, we wanted to turn on the lights. And so, with the new target picker, if we're choosing something that could have many devices, like an area or a label, for example, now we can see all the different devices that are contained in that area or label. That's really useful. This gives you full visibility into what's exactly being controlled in this automation. And so for entities or devices, if you only control those specifically, eh, this may not be that big of a deal because you already kind of knew what device that you were acting on in the first place. But if you use areas and labels, this is gonna be big for you because now you'll be able to see exactly which devices you're automating in your automation instead of just hoping that you got all of the areas and labels set up correctly. So if you wanna combine an entity with an area, you can also do that too. And your automation would act against all of those devices that it found. This allows you to mix and match things based on your needs. And speaking of mixing and matching, that brings us to our next feature, which is the dashboard card names have gotten a better way to choose what text is displayed. You can still add a custom name like you can before, but now when you're creating a dashboard card, you can have the name pull from the device that it's displaying. And so you can show the entity, the device, the floor, or the area in the card's name. And so you can also combine them if you wanted to have your naming scheme that way. So if you wanted the room shown first and then the entity's name after it, you could do that and it would be reflected in the dashboard automatically. That's what's actually really cool about these is that they auto update based on the device that they're displaying. So if you have, let's say the lights and you wanted to rename it, like in the prior example, it said living room lights, living room, which is kind of dumb. It's kind of dumb sounding. So if you wanted to change that device name to just lights, you would do so. And then the card would auto update when you're using this new naming feature. So you're gonna wanna make sure that your devices are named appropriately 
and are in the correct areas in order for this to be the most useful. So drop me a comment if you're interested in a video about Home Assistant naming schemes. And so there's also a few smaller updates in this month's release. The update dialog box now shows an estimated progress for the Home Assistant installations and add-on updates that are controlled by the supervisor. It'll never be exact, but it's good to get kind of a nice feel for how long something's gonna take. If you're using solar panels or you have the energy reports feature turned on, then instead of a bar graph like there was before, that now has the option to show a pie graph. So you just click the button in the right-hand part of the screen and it'll switch between either format, depending on which one you like. And the home dashboard has also gotten a few tweaks in this release as well. Areas are grouped by floor, which makes it easier to get a snapshot view of your entire home. The suggested entities and favorites sections have been combined into a single section, and the light, climate, and safety views have been moved into their own dedicated panels. And so you can get those under settings and dashboards. As usual, check out the new integrations and breaking changes to see if any of those affect you. In terms of new integrations, there were two that stood out to me this month. The first is the OpenRGB integration. OpenRGB is a project that lets you control your gaming PC's RGB lights through an open source project without having to use any of the vendor apps. And so now you can control those OpenRGB lights through Home Assistant directly. So that's pretty cool. And the Nintendo Parental Controls integration has been added this month as well. This one adds sensors for used screen time and how much remaining time occurs before a bedtime alarm or something like that and allows you to take actions based on those values. So this could be useful for you if you have little ones who play a lot of Nintendo Switch 2 and you want to be able to control how much they're playing their games. Man, I would have hated that as a kid. This video up here is one that YouTube think you'll enjoy, so tap or click that one to watch that one next if it interests you. And as always, I'll see you in the next one.